Charles Summer Smith, and I'm called Secretary and Chief Executive of the Royal Academy of Arts. I've been here for five years. How did you define achievement? For myself and for the job, it's to do with the success or otherwise of the Royal Academy. As the Chief Executive, I feel I'm accountable for whether or not it's doing well, and how do I measure whether or not it's doing well? It's partly economic. It's not that easy to run as an organisation because we don't have any government funding. We're entirely privately funded, and we're incredibly dependent on the success or otherwise of our exhibitions programme. And to be truthful, every year is tough because the economics of an arts institution without public subsidy are essentially tough. So that if I'm doing my job well, the Royal Academy survives. And if it didn't survive, I would be doing it extremely badly. <laughs> I was brought up in a middle class professional family. My father was an Indian civil servant up until the time of Indian independence, and then he came back to Britain in 1947, and he worked for the church. I went to private schools, I went to university, I was at Cambridge as a student. I got interested in art history quite early. I was interested in medieval brasses and church architecture when I was 12 or 13, encouraged by my other brother. And then I did history of art A-level, very much encouraged by a history teacher at school. I think if you talk to and read about people's biographies in public life, very often they've been influenced by somebody at school. I was certainly influenced by my history teacher, Peter Cut. And then I went to the university and then I did a doctorate. I was of a generation who were brought up to think that if you were good academically, then the best thing to do was to remain in academic life. But when I finished my PhD in 1982, there weren't any academic jobs, except there were six in Perth, Western Australia, and one in Sydney. And my PhD supervisor said I wouldn't advise you to go to Australia. And then I got a job in the Victorian Albert Museum. And I've always thought that actually in some ways, in, in some ways I was a beneficiary of the fact that instead of remaining in academic life, I had to go out into broader public life and work in museums, which were about the relationship between art and its public. And I found that very rewarding. I was the youngest child of a family of four. And I can't disguise or dispute the fact that we were encouraged to do well at school. It was expected of us. And my two older brothers were both highly intelligent and successful at school and got scholarships to their secondary school, which in order to go to private school, they had to because my parents couldn't afford it to send them away to school if they hadn't got scholarships. So there was quite a lot of pressure, I think, on them. And oddly enough, as a child, I have the view that I was treated as the one who was not as able academically. Um, so that, and in fact, my father was slightly less under pressure, even though I when I was a child, so I wasn't put under such pressure. But I certainly felt some pressure because my older brothers had both done very well at school. And in fact, I didn't get a scholarship to <laughs> school. And I, I sometimes feel I've spent the whole the rest of my life trying to recover from that early failing that whereas my older, older brothers were all very talented and did, you know, got scholarships. My, my um, middle brother went to Cambridge, got a scholarship, did extremely well, was a mathematician, was very good as a violinist, and I wasn't very good at maths and I wasn't very good at music and I wasn't good at, so good at sports. And so in the end, 
I sort of found my niche doing history and history of art. And all of that is a way of saying, I'm the first to recognize, as I've said, that I benefited from being in a family where it was a supportive environment, if, if anything, a slightly competitive environment in terms of academic performance. But it's never stated, but there was a presumption and expectation in practice that we would do well. And I can remember that we used to play a game a lot, quite competitively, as a family, which was called the six-letter word game, which was that you had to identify the word, the six-letter word, which somebody had thought of, through a various uh, a, a process of deduction. And I suddenly realised now, with my own children, I would never dream of making them play such a sort of obviously competitive linguistic game. Um, but in practice, it was probably a very good thing because one developed vocabulary and linguistic skills, and I don't myself think competition is necessarily a bad thing. I sometimes think that people think, and I think wrongly, that I've had a relatively easy and straightforward career, if I think of ter in terms of sort of activity in my working life, um, because I had a job at the v &A. I was appointed director of the National Portrait Gallery when I was relatively young. I went from the National Portrait Gallery to the National Gallery, and then I went from the National Gallery to the Royal Academy of Art. So that if you look, if you look at my curriculum vitae, it looks relatively straightforward. On the other hand, um, both professionally and in terms of my private life, I don't think anybody's life is as completely straightforward as it looks on paper. I had quite a tricky moment when I was at the National Gallery where by accident <laughs> when I was leaving the National Gallery to come to the Royal Academy it was put into the press that I was leaving because of um, differences of opinion in the trustee body which was not completely untrue and all of that was quite tough. Um, I've had not a completely straightforward time um, um, over the last 10 years because my wife has MS. So I've had to juggle with the fact that um, at home, I can't disguise or dispute the fact that, I mean, my wife is now completely paralyzed from the neck downwards. She can't even turn the pages of a book. So that I think under those circumstances, in every play, juggling one's professional career with the private circumstances of one's life is not completely straightforward. I, I personally have always enjoyed the process of writing. I get a different form of satisfaction. I mean, running an organisation is one form of satisfaction, but it's complicated. I think in all organisations there's a lot of politics, there's a lot of administration, there's a lot of finance, and all of that is stimulating in a way, but it involves a huge amount of collaboration. And that form of collaboration isn't necessarily personally satisfying in the way I find writing, where in writing, you're writing partly from your conscious mind and partly from and it's a particular form of creative activity where I'm conscious that at the end of a morning where one's written a certain amount, it's very much what one's done oneself. And so I, I personally find that a rather different order of satisfaction from sort of at the end of a day, long day, in the office where I've had six committee meetings and seven problems and institutional organisational life I think is necessarily much more messy and complex and doesn't lead to the same order of personal satisfaction as individual creative activity. In any life there are compensating things which one has to seek out forms of personal satisfaction 
to do with building relationships, doing things which one has created control over, fulfilling a sense of one's own potential. I mean, there are lots of things I would like to be able to spend more time with. I don't feel I've developed a knowledge of music, which I would like to. I haven't read any poetry since I was at school. I think my sense is that anybody who's been in a conventional way successful in a worldly way has necessarily probably had to narrow down their lives and exclude some areas of activity in order to focus on what their requirement is better to do professionally. And so I would say to the people who aren't in organizations or doing things which are conventionally conceived of as inverted commas success, that there are huge numbers of satisfaction, forms of satisfaction in life, which have nothing to do with worldly success, which are to do with appreciating the art, landscape, music, doing things for oneself and fulfilling oneself to the best of one's own ability. I think everybody, you can go so far, and if you go as far as you can, and stretch oneself, and do things to the best of one's ability, that's a form of satisfaction, which is at least as valuable as doing well, well in the world.